Thank you all for coming. The purpose of today's briefing was to talk about the impending CR that we are facing as a community. Um, we, uh, NIH advocates, science advocates, um, worked hard and did what we usually do with uh, the appropriations process, working with many of you and other staffers to kind of get the best that we can get in the fiscal environment that we're living in. Um, and organizations and agencies like the NIH were destined to receive um, sizable and needed increases this uh, this week between uh, the House and the Senate, depending on which bill you looked at, one billion or two billion dollar increase. Uh, the National Science Foundation was looking at maybe flat to a four hundred million dollar increase this fiscal year. Um, these are things that we were excited about and really offer uh, the potential for the scientific community to do um, exciting things. Uh, to advance medical breakthroughs to help develop cures um, and improve treatments for patients uh, both in the United States and beyond there. Um, and unfortunately, the risk of a CR puts a lot of the possibility and potential of those funding increases um, at risk. Um, I think we're, we're not naive to say that we recognize that a short-term CR of three months is certainly a likelihood right now. Um, and what we wanted to do is talk about how a CR impacts the scientific community, how fiscal uncertainty impacts the NIH and its ability to fund science and to grant, um, and to uh, allow funding for grants within their budgetary process. Um, also talk about kind of how scientists view what a CR does and kind of what that means for individuals in laboratories across the country. Um, and also we want to talk a little bit about education and how we're educating the next generation of scientists and how the CR puts some new programs um, in risk if that ends up being kind of transitioning from a short-term to a long-term CR. We know that there are just a few weeks to go, or actually just a week to go to develop the process, but we wanted to have an event and say, please, 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 please do your jobs. Let's get an omnibus and let's try to avoid a CR. Um, so without further ado, our first speaker is going to be Harry Stein from the Center for American Progress. Harry is the Director of Fiscal Policy at uh, CAB. His work focuses on the tax and spending choices within the federal budget, and he has written extensively about topics including appropriations, package tax expenditures, and the budgetary outlook. Uh, prior to joining the Senator, he worked as a legislative assistant for Senator Herb Cole. Um, Harry has appeared on radio and television stations, including MSNBC, CNBC, BBC, were quoted in lots of fancy newspapers that you all have heard of and read. Um, and today we are lucky enough to have him here with us. And so without further ado, we'll turn it over to Harry. As kind of a broad overall point, I would just say that a CR is, is bad for governing. Um, it's an unforced error. It hurts the economy. It hurts national security on the defense side and also on the on your non defense um, security programs. And it does that for no good reason. There's no benefit to passing a CR. Usually there's pro and con, but a CR is just con. It's just Congress failing to do its job. Um, that's particularly galling to me this year after a year where we've seen both in the House and Senate a lot of interest in the budget committees on um, reforming the budget process. And we've heard um, from, from the folks who know that this in the House and, 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 and Senate that, that the budget process is broken. And one of the points that is made in advance of the idea that the budget process is broken is that appropriation bills don't get done on time. There's no excuse for failing to do your job on appropriations here. There's, there's, there's the appropriations committees have been working all year. There's the House and Senate have produced legislation. The only reason not to do an omnibus is just so somebody else can sign it. And, and, and if you want to go in and reopen, reopen the fight, that, that, that were hashed out in the budget deal that, that, that laid the groundwork for, for the omnibus this year. It's not a failing of the process. And, and I'm actually, Chairman Price is going to be at Brookings tomorrow. He's going to roll out a lot of budget process form recommendations. I'll be one of the people there responding to them. And this is a point that I'll make there too, that, that there's no, so much of what's broken about the process is, is just choices that are being made as opposed to something about the process that, that dooms it. Um, a, a CR is going to put planning and investment decisions, particularly anything where you're thinking about trying to do something over the long term on hold throughout the federal government. We're going to hear about that specifically within the scientific community, but 
basically what you're giving data is true in every sector. That agencies can't do any kind of long-term planning, grant recipients or contractors can't do any long-term planning, and there's a lot of waste that comes from that when you're just kind of having to string along whatever you've been doing as opposed to making any kind of more structural reform where you need more of a long-term commitment from Congress about what, what funding levels are going to be. The other concern with the CR is that you're flat funding everything in a way that creates this kind of slow squeeze on programs. We know that inflation is a real thing even though there's not much inflation. Um, and a CR is a way of basically squeezing programs without having to actually make any decisions about where you're cutting, where you're investing, where it makes sense to cut programs. I mean, there's, there's a smart way to do this, and there's, there's a not smart way to do it, and a CR is, is not a smart way to do it. But what a CR does is it avoids responsibility for those choices. It just says we're going to basically keep everything across the board where it is, and so no one's got to take responsibility for making hard choices in appropriations bills. Um, there's, there's impacts of this that happen immediately, and, and we'll hear about some of them. And they also get worse over time. We saw this um, with the sequester in 2013, where agencies can move around some money, and there's some one-time gimmicks that you can use when things get flat funded and squeezed, and you can draw down on money that's been accumulated in investment accounts, and, and you can kind of keep the trains running to some degree. But not forever. And, and so what we saw in, in, in this, with the sequester is not only did a lot of bad things happen immediately, the kids got, we lost Head Start slots in scientific community in particular really got hit hard. Um, but those cuts would have gotten quite a lot worse if sequester had been left in place in full. And fortunately, thank you, we didn't do that. Um, we got a two year budget deal for 2014 and 2015, and now we're on another budget deal for 2016 and 2017. And the fact that we have these hard-fought bipartisan budget agreements, generally when we have those, we've been able to do appropriations in a relatively smooth and timely fashion, which is really why there's no excuse to not be able to do that this, this year. We've been able to do that past year if there's a budget deal. Um, but to give some examples here, um, in the past, Congress has authorized fairly large increases for scientific research. Um, and those increases have not come through because the appropriations weren't there. And that's because the overall allocation was too low and because money wasn't found within that allocation to support those decisions. I mean, it really is an appropriation where this is important. Um, back in 2009, Congress made a strong commitment to support national services subject that I've written about. One of the pieces that, of that was funding 250,000 positions. We've never come close to that. And, and that's because the money just was not available in appropriations. And this is the kind of slow squeeze where every year you just get a little bit further from the goal when you're flat funding programs and not providing enough of an increase in the overall allocation. And it's important to note here that under a CR or under an omnibus, the overall allocation is going to be roughly the same. It's a question of how you build up money, but that's a really important question. And, and Congress has made some of those decisions this year, um, and, and, and it's better to do that than, than, to, than to not do that and just go on autopilot. Um, but it's also important to fight for the overall allocation, and we know that sequester comes back in the next fiscal year, and getting into the habit of not going in and doing appropriation bills makes it easier to just make across the board cuts to these programs and not have to take responsibility for those um, either. Um, so that leads me to a point that, that you know, I think that, that we've got folks here at the scientific community, I think that there may be some other folks here representing other, other sectors of the non-defense discretionary budget really important for folks that care about non-defense discretionary programs to stand together and be allied to other folks that support other non-defense discretionary programs. And we're, one of the sponsors, I think, of this is, is the NED United Coalition. I think that's been incredibly important to getting an overall good allocation, getting a good budget deal. Because without a decent allocation, there's just no way to support these programs. And so it's very important to not get kind of picked off in, in these appropriation fights and to stand together with the broader coalition for non-defense programs because we're all going to need each other next year too. Um, and finally, I'll just say, you know, we're in this kind of weird space right now in the lame duck where we know that there's going to be a different president and, 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 and a different Congress next year. Um, that shouldn't 
cause people to feel compelled to agree to a bad deal on appropriations, either a bad CR with ideological riders, or a bad omnibus, for that matter, with bad funding cuts or ideological riders. Um, next year, like this year, Congress will need bipartisan support to pass appropriations bills, at least in the Senate. Um, that's true this year, that's true next year. And um, there's going to be a desire, to, there's going to be a pretty full plate next year. And, and I, I don't think that there's going to be a desire to, to get hung up in very long fights here um, because there's so many other things like the FY18 appropriations process. Um, a budget resolution, maybe two budget resolutions. Um, and the reconciliation bills that might be associated with those. Um, there's, so there's no reason to just feel like, well, we're going to have to accept bad riders, we have to accept bad funding cuts because it's only going to get worse. There's still going to be a need for bipartisan support next year, just like, um, just like there will this year. So, you know, I think at the end of the day, you vote on what's put in front of you, and, and there's no reason that that needs to be a CR. Um, at the end of the day, the alternative, if the alternative is the government shut down, you know, I think that you, you need to evaluate that and see what, what's in the CR is cleaner than riders. Um, but the, the better outcome here would be a good omnibus. And there's no reason, given all the work that Congress has done this year, um, that that can't happen. And if Congress is going to choose not to do that, the folks that care about NIH funding, that care about the other pro the programs in in the omnibus should be very loud and clear on that point, that this is just an unforced error and Congress is making it harder to do good science and making it harder for government to function in general um, for no good reason. And with that, I'll turn it over um, and we can kind of get more into the specifics. I've been quite general um, about the CR versus the omnibus. Thank you very much. Um, we are going to transition to the specifics, and so our next speaker will be Tom Baldwin. Uh, Tom is the president-elect of FASA, the Federation of American Societies for Experimental Biology. He is a professor of biochemistry at the University of California, Riverside, where he served as the dean of the College of Natural and Agricultural Sciences from 2008 to 2012. He's the chair of the Public Outreach Committee at ASBNB. And uh, Dr. Baldwin represents ASBNB on the FASA Board of Directors. Um, did previously um, and serves on the FASA and Public Affairs Committee. Um, Dr. Baldwin is a passionate advocate for science, um, for basic investigator initiated research, and for the scientific community generally. Um, he feels strongly that the next generation of scientists need to be empowered not only to do outstanding science, but also to communicate with excitement and joy, uh, with excitement and joy, the significance of scientific discovery um, that it will have on, on the public. And so, without further ado, Tom. Thank you very much, Ben, and uh, thanks to all of you taking your time to come uh, and listen to us uh, drone on about something that is really quite, quite important. Uh, I'm here on behalf of the American Society for Biochemistry and Molecular Biology and the Federation of American Societies for Experimental Biology. Together, these two organizations represent over 125,000 working scientists at universities and laboratories across the country. Uh, that's just the dues paying there are a lot of work of scientists out there in that, in that group. Uh, this group really does um, care very deeply about what Congress is doing uh, with the continuing resolution, and I'll try to give you some insight into what, what goes on uh, in the scientist's laboratory uh, in these times. Certainly, the degree to keep the federal agencies, uh, to keep the federal government front is very, very important. Failing to complete the work of FY17 uh, appropriations will, will have very serious consequences at the National Institutes of Health and other uh, funding agencies. More strictly speaking, uh, it will have serious consequences in the ability of scientists who are doing the search to complete their discovery uh, activities. Now, as you know, NIH, as well as other agencies, have been operating under continual resolution for the last two months. And it's already having an impact on researchers across the country. Uh, consistent with what has been done under prior CRs, scientists are told to curtail their spending to reduce their spending level by 10% because of the ambiguity in the CR rate. Universities are told to monitor the account very, very closely because at the end of the CR, if, if, if there's not a budget, then the universities are going to be on the hook for any money that has already been spent. So the universities have to monitor. 
mind that it's pretty close. A 10% cut might not sound like a very big deal, but when you realize the fraction of the budget uh, that goes to personnel, a 10% cut is a huge cut. A 10% reduction might cost the entire supply budget for an individual laboratory, or it might mean that someone will have to lose their job. So it becomes, even, a, even for a two-month CR, can be a very, very serious problem. Uh, if we go to a longer-term CR, go to a, to a March uh, CR, the problem becomes even greater. Uh, the CRs uh, severely constrained NIH ability to fund new research projects and investigator-initiated grants will be seriously affected. Those researchers who just had the grant applications reviewed might have to wait months to get the grant for the grant to start if they ever start because of the ambiguity. By a continuing resolution. If people have to lay, be laid off, this causes serious long term problems. The technicians, skilled technicians, uh, you don't find uh, on the street. They don't respond to the classified ads in the newspaper. Outstanding technicians are actually created in the laboratory. It requires, first of all, a very strong background but then a lot of training. By the nature of science, you're doing experiments that have never been done before. And that requires an incredible amount of training. So when you lose a technician, you have lost all the money, all the time, all the effort that went into training that technician. That all has to be done at the beginning. Now, Francis Collins, uh, who was the director of the NIH, said here in Washington this last week that a CR would be, and I quote, an extremely unfortunate painful outcome for biomedical research because of the uncertainty it would create throughout the research enterprise. And NIH cannot invest in or plan long-term research projects if it is not clear how much funding will be available or when it can be spent. Delaying approval of the budget will also force NIH to spend a year's worth of money in just six months, which would make it difficult to spend the money in the most innovative efficient way. Now, let me tell you a couple of stories. Uh, there are two of many that I want to tell you. I think that telling these stories might convey a lot more information than all the statistics that I've given for you. First, I want to tell you about uh, a beginning assistant professor who was hired at the University of California by a chemistry department, it's my own department, University of California Riverside. He was hired in the fall of 2008 when I was dean of the College of Natural and Agricultural Sciences. He was a new recruit, and of course he came in with an earned PhD degree, and he had done extensive postdocs. His field was X-ray crystallography. X-ray crystallography is a very, very technical field that requiring a great deal of training. To recruit him to, to UCR, I had to spend two million dollars of college funds to buy the incredibly expensive, sophisticated equipment required for him even to walk in the door and start doing any experiments whatsoever. He came in, went to work, started doing great experiments, publishing very nice papers, uh, basically running on a very small amount of money I was able to put in his lab to get him started, what's called start -ups. He started writing grants right from the very beginning, sending grant applications to the state of California and to federal funding agencies. Do you remember what was going on in 08, 09, that time frame? Nobody, the California budget, that was the great crunch. The California budget was really on the rocks. And he wrote great grant applications, I reviewed them myself, but they weren't funded because of just no money. So this went on year after year after year after year. Then, in 2013, there was a bipartisan budget deal that was struck between Senator Murray and Congressman Ryan. Put a little bit more money into the system. But more important, it provided stability to the funding system. And that allowed people the courage, it gave them the courage to go ahead and fund the grant. He got that grant funded, and because of that, he was promoted to associate professor with tenure. I have no doubt in my mind, had he not gotten that grant because it was right at the end of his probationary period, had he 
Had he not gotten that grant, he would have been unemployed. He would have lost his job. Now this is what you call a real travesty. Someone, after that many years, has turned out of a job. So it's the thing about assistant professor. It's, it's, a, it's a very tough business to work in. Assistant professors are hired in the sciences. They're given a seven-year probationary period. And they must demonstrate their ability to do science and to compete with extramural grant funds. If you don't get that grant funded, it's the end of the line. Let me tell you a second story. This guy, he was the last graduate student to actually graduate from my lab. Quite proud of this guy. Uh, he graduated from the University of Arizona in Tucson, where I was before I moved to, to Riverside. He graduated in 09, went to the University of Wisconsin, Madison. He worked hard, he did well. Uh, started applying for jobs in 2013. Uh, he, the first year he applied for jobs, uh, he got a few nibbles, but no interviews. The second year, he continued applying. He got many interviews, but no job offers. His third year, he got many job offers and had the difficult position to pay for which job to take. So he went to the University of Texas at Dallas. And the first thing he did, he'd probably been there for no more than a week when he <coughs> submitted his first NIH credentials. He called me just a couple of weeks ago and said, my goodness, it's going to be funded. It had gotten an incredibly strong priority score, and it was definitely funded. And he was, you know, this sort of thing happens to a young person. Oftentimes, it leads to early promotion and tenure. But he's just recently found out that because of continuing resolution, that grant is not going to be funded for a while, possibly a long while, and possibly not at all. So that's the real-life situation that we're dealing with. Academic scientists are, in many respects, small business. You might think of every laboratory and every science laboratory in the university as being a small business. They have to make payroll, they hire people, they buy supplies, they buy equipment, all the things that a small business can There are two primary differences an academic laboratory as a small business and what we normally think of as a small business. Number one, the staff that are hired by a scientist are incredibly hard to find and they're very, very highly trained. So it takes years to build an effective research. Number two, a laboratory does not sell anything, so they don't turn a profit. So they don't have any way of sort of continuing the process of making something, selling something, bringing money, and keeping the process going. They keep the process going by, from research grants. Uh, they bring the money in from the National Institute of Health, the National Science Foundation, the Research Service, you know all the alphabet soup. Uh, they, they, but the, business, the idea I want to leave you with is it takes six to eight years to build strong research team. It can be lost in a heartbeat with a continuing resolution. Yes, I do indeed know firsthand that you cannot turn research funding off and on like a faucet. University of California, Riverside, where I was am a biochemistry professor of marriages, it relies on federal dollars from NIH to support researchers promising young postdocs working in that really across the campus. And that's true universities departments all across the country. As former dean of the College of Natural and Agricultural Sciences, I witnessed the devastation that comes when a faculty member is forced to close a lab due to lack of funding and watch talented scientists leave research for our communities. <coughs> Best science takes years to advance, from questions to breakthroughs to applications and conducted patients. Without the certainty of funding in FY17, Researchers and innovators, like those supported by NIH, will be seriously hampered in their efforts to develop new treatments for devastating diseases. Congress' failure to approve a budget is especially devastating, given that researchers have been hoping NIH would receive its second substantial <coughs> increase in a row after a dozen years of flat budgets and little loss of more than one and a half billion dollars due to sequestration. Omnibus appropriations bill for FY16 provided in 
additional two billion dollars, even with that increase in funding. NIH's capacity to support research is still lower than it was prior to This is why the research community was thrilled when the Senate Appropriations Committee passed a bipartisan bill in June that provided another two billion dollar increase for NIH. Unfortunately, the Senate's NIH funding bill was just one of eleven spending measures that never received. Increased funding for the nation's research agencies is needed to restore grants for investigator-initiated research that have declined in recent years due to spending cuts from the inflationary policy. A long-term strategy to sustain federal investment in biological and biomedical research will ensure the most efficient use of funding and optimize the allocation of resources. To facilitate long-term planning, support the next generation of researchers, and maximize scientific progress. Funding agencies and institutions and investigators need stable, predictable research budgets. The five-year strategic plan that NIH submitted to Congress nearly a year ago emphasizes this theme as well, noting that a, quote, strengthened and a sustained commitment to NIH support of research is critical because delays in scientific progress can have a dire impact on the health of individuals and communities in which they live as well as their nation's overall public. In conclusion, I urge Congress to make finalizing the FY17 Appropriations Bill the highest priority during the remaining weeks of the lame duck session. There is still time to make the Senate propose $34.1 billion for the United States a reality if our legislators complete the work that America is hired to do. Thank you, Tom. Um, uh, our final speaker is James Brown, who is the Executive Director of the STEM Education Coalition, um, <clears throat> which is an alliance of more than 500 businesses, professional, and educational organizations that works to raise awareness in Congress, the administration, and other organizations about the critical role that STEM, science, te technology, engineering, and mathematics, education plays in enabling the U.S. to remain the economic and technological leader of the global marketplace for the 21st century. Prior to joining the coalition, he was an assistant director for advocacy at the American Chemical Society. He is a nuclear engineer by training, which makes him a lot smarter than probably most of us. Um, and previously worked as a legislative aide for uh, Representative Doc Hastings. Um, thank you, thank you, Tom. Uh, the, uh, so it's it's I think a bit ironic that we're talking about federal funding on Giving Tuesday. So I'm going to start off with a couple of statistics that uh, sort of illustrate our world and, uh, and how we're trying to advance STEM education in the context of this funding environment. Um, so a few years ago, Harris, which is one of the big polling companies, did a, a poll of parents and asked them about priorities in the school system. But something like 94% of parents agreed that STEM, and STEM means a lot of different things to different people, but mostly what it means is the skills of the future and problem solving and all those things. Um, to some people, it's about STEAM and art. And others, it's about jobs and technology or technicians. So however you term STEM, 94% of parents um, thought it should be a priority in their schools, but only 49% thought it was a priority in their schools. And that's perhaps um, also ironic that the same poll found that two-thirds of parents think their kids are in the top third of their class. So I think those are, um, those are um, probably not unrelated um, results. Um, what I'd like to do is, uh, is talk about a little bit different aspect of, uh, of this equation over sort of long-term budgets and the, the, you know, we're going through a, a historic presidential transition that very few people in this town saw coming. Um, it's obviously affected the politics of spending and the future outlook for these things. And, and I, I'd like to talk about sort of two scenarios and how they apply to STEM education, some of the issues that we're following, and also some of the other research budgets that, uh, that fall outside of NIH. And I'm going to start there. So there are a lot of good things that happened in this year's budget process. Actually, this was a budget process that got further than many of the last several years. Um, and it's genuinely a lament that, that uh, you know, up, up until election day, the, the negotiators on the appropriations staff were working through an omnibus. So it's lamentable that, that that progress is lost. But I'll just give you a couple of examples of, of, of other areas of science where there are real decisions um, at risk. So uh, one is in the, in, uh, 
in the area of Antarctic exploration. So NSF operates, has operated a fleet of icebreakers for many, many years. And those of you who are in the science advocacy world are always hearing about the icebreaker issue in NSF. Well, it turns out we're down to one icebreaker. And the Senate bill would fund three, the House bill would fund half of a new one. So that's a practical issue if I'm an explorer on the South Pole right now. I'm kind of hoping that, uh, that we can keep bringing food to my station. So that's a practical example of an issue that's on the table with, with an omnibus discussion that a CR does not resolve. Um, on the other end of the spectrum, so from cold to hot, the, uh, the other issue that I was going to highlight was the international fusion experiment. The Department of Energy is another example of something that's at risk, if you will, in terms of how the funding bill plays out. So uh, we are participants in an international consortium. It's called INER, which is the International Thermo Nuclear um, experimental reactor, I believe, is the full acronym there. But it's an international consortium where the Senate bill, so sort of tables split, would withdraw from that project. The House bill would continue in that project. And so you can imagine what the next several months or perhaps the next year mean for people involved in a project like that, which has long lead time for involved international cooperation and so forth. So just an example of outside of the life sciences, there are numerous physical science decisions that involve construction of new facilities or of, of new projects. And, and believe me when I tell you that students in the STEM fields take symptoms from these decisions about whether or not a project goes forward before it follows through on a decision to become a scientist or an engineer or to choose some other field um, where those uncertainties might be different. So, um, but I wanted to strike a little bit different note um, uh, and, and perhaps a more positive note and talk about one specific education issue that's an example of sort of the, the, the kind of progress you can make and the need for having an ongoing appropriations process that works. So last fall, I mean, perhaps the most bipartisan, widely supported bill that the Congress has passed um, since the, the, the election of 2010, where parties changed on the, in the House, um, was the passage of a bill called the Every Student Succeeds Act. So replace No Child Left Behind. Um, many of us have kids that grew up in the No Child and Left Behind era. So it was a massively bipartisan bill. It passed the Senate. I think there was one dissenting vote in the Senate, and there were like 15 dissenting votes in the House. President Obama signed it in December of last year. And it set in place a new landscape <coughs> for both state and federal decision making around a whole host of different issues. But I'll give you one example of something um, that, that affects the STEM community, in which we, we were very optimistic and very, um, frankly, proud to see that was a program called the Student Support and Academic Enrichment Grants Program. It's called Title IV Part A of the law. It's a totally new program. We provide for the first time districts with a pot of federal funding that would range somewhere between twenty dollars and $100,000 per district. And that's, there are 14,000 school districts, so you can sort of do the math there um, as to what the total funding levels would be and what that means. But one of the challenges, the reason why this program is it allows districts to make decisions with federal dollars about academic enrichment activities and to fund activities that the federal government has actually never allowed schools to use federal money, funding for. And a good example of those are things like um, robotics competitions. Have you ever, ever heard of FIRST Robotics? This is a big robot competitions that get together. They actually do this at the St. Louis uh, football stadium with like 40,000 students. And it's TV time. It's like a rock star event. But that's an example of something that that many of your suburban upscale schools can afford to send a team to St. Louis to compete in, in the same way that they would send a football team to the state championship, or a, a marching band to a competition or something of that kind. Except for a lot of schools that don't have the funding to support that, that the better off schools do. And so if you were to approach a Title I school in the inner city of St. Louis and say, hey, now there's $100,000 available, would you use this to support a first robotics team for maybe two or three schools in that, in that district? You might get a lot of people nodding their heads at that. And that's an example of a new program that was authorized in the, you know, at the end of a presidency. At the, you know, so we had to go through a funding bill in the last year of an outgoing president. But it was something that was widely agreed to by Congress. And the continuing resolution doesn't put this law in a position to succeed going forward. So now you're in an environment where if I'm in the Department of Education, or more importantly, I'm a district superintendent, I don't even know if this program is going to exist next year. So, uh, you know, I don't know if I it's worth it to put together an application to apply for those federal funds, or I just roll those funds into something else, or I just let it go and maybe come back at another time when the federal government has sort of sorted out its, its, uh, its 
flavor bonds. And, and to compound it further, um, there's a big difference between the House and Senate on the funding level. So the current dollars funding level for this program is about $280 million. The House, the, the, the bill that I talked about, the Other Student Succeeds Act, authorizes $1.65 billion. It's one of the biggest new initiatives to put money in the hands of state and district officials for these kinds of things. So $1.65 billion. The administration proposed $500 million for it in their budget request. The House bill has $300 million for it. The Senate bill has $300 million for it. And the House bill has $1 billion for it. So if I'm a district superintendent, I'm looking at, on the one hand, when an outcome for an average school might be $150,000, or on the other hand, it's $20,000. I don't know if the $20,000 program is worth putting together the application for. Now, a lot of school districts, a lot of people from Washington might say, well, $20,000 is not a lot of money either. But it means a lot if the cost of a first robotics team is only five or ten thousand dollars. So, so this is an example of another uh, instance where you know we got together and agreed on a bill that took years to negotiate, ten years to negotiate this bill, and reach consensus on things like accountability, all these other hard issues. Um, but one small piece of that is providing districts with the funds so that you can go back to the to the town hall meeting where the parents said STEM should be a priority. And the superintendent's response used to be, well, we don't have any funding to do that. Maybe now in the future, the response can be, we might be able to use this new pot of federal funds to do it, but only if Congress figures out how to fund it. And you can't start this new program with a continuing resolution. Um, so that's part of the challenge that we're dealing with, is that you know, it's, it affects research budgets for these massive infrastructures like NIH and NASA. Department of Defense and so forth, where people are making macroscopic decisions, but it also inhibits our ability to do some of the limited but really meaningful new things that Congress has agreed on. So, just a little bit of perspective uh, to talk about, you know, the softer side of, of sort of how the education system sees this. Too. Thank you, James. Um, with that, I think what we wanted to do is open it up for questions people may have, uh, either broad economic or specific to. Scientific community or NIH. So, please, anybody have any questions for the panel? Um, 
there's already going to be a lot of question marks up in the air for FY18. Doing a CR for all of FY17 only makes all those questions all the more ambiguous. Um, a full a full year CR becomes a pretty messy process, leaves a lot of questions unanswered, and, and the ones that it does try to answer will probably answer in a fairly haphazard way. But most importantly, they, and, and, and we might you know we could hear a bit more specifics, but all of the things that we're hearing with the problems of a three month CR only get worse um, the longer that a CR goes for. Any other questions? So I just wanted to add one one part to that is the, you know for most of this year and those of you who worked on the appropriations process obviously know this by heart but the you know part of the reason why we've been moving towards an omnibus was because President Obama sort of laid a marker down saying I'm not going to vote for a continuing resolution I'm not going to sign a continuing resolution I want a budget deal that goes forward um, and obviously the result of the election changes how that process works right? the one so to back to your question about what, what will be at in March is, you know, we, we will be at a point in the process where we have, a, you know, a president, a Senate, and a House are all the same party, right? That changes the dynamic about all this. But we won't be to the point where the new administration has a budget out by March, I don't think. I mean, historically, the first budget of the new administration was out by April. So, so we still have to cross that bridge of how do we make decisions, you know, you're going to make decisions about the spending bill before you put out a budget presumably before you do anything on reconciliation or anything on some of the other big legislative vehicles. So I would say this question is there are, there are tendencies both ways. I can, I can see all the, all the political calculations punting this down the road, but I can also see this as an opportunity to make some early decisions and maybe do what I would call like a mini bus, where you make a set of decisions and not every funding bill as a set of decisions. And then you don't handicap some of the things where there's agreement um, on both sides of the aisle, in between the House and the Senate. And, and, and I would add, by the way, that NIH funding is one of those places of largely of agreement. Hi, um, could you explain a little bit about um, the grant cycle for, for a researcher? So is when, they're, when they receive a grant, is it for one year, or is it multi-year funding? And then how is that, that picture affected? Like if you're in the middle of multi-year funding and there's a CR, what happens? Does your money for the rest of the grant disappear, or how does that work? Sure, I can I can explain that. I've seen it happen a couple times. Uh, <clears throat> back when the NIH budget was double, it was ramping up at a fairly good rate, and the idea was that once it reached the end of the doubling, it was supposed to fall over slowly into a slower rate of increase. And what happened, if you recall, is that the increase stopped and it was flatlined. Now, when grants are made from the NIH, they're made for either a four or five year period of time, depending upon which, what kind of grant it is. Let's just say, for the sake of argument, four years. So if in the last year of the doubling, someone got a grant for four years, that was a commitment for the next four years. And if the budget does not continue to ramp up, what that means is no new grants. So the young people who are just coming into the system can't get a grant to get started. And they have this clock that's ticking, this probationary period, where they have to get a grant or they won't get promoted. Okay? So for the NIH, it's usually four to five years. But, but no, a CR does not cut the grant off, what it does is it says, okay, everybody's budget is going to go down by 10%, or it might be 10% each year it goes down, another 10%. Okay? I've seen that happen. NSF grants are three years. Now, something about how the grant cycle works for a beginning person, if you're a young faculty member, you're just starting out, you get your first grant funded, you have to now, suppose it's an NIH grant, got four years. At the end of three years, you have to write your first competing renewal. Okay? But you've only got now three years worth of data to demonstrate what you managed to accomplish. Assume that you get that grant renewed through that first cycle. Now you come up at, after 
three years of that four-year grant to write another competing renewal. Well, you've got not only the three years that that grant started, you've got the last year of the previous grant. So you've got a larger, longer period of time to amass data. Basically, you have things that are in the pipeline so that that the longer you're in the job, the, the more you have to show for what you've been doing. So the, the, it's, it's very hard on young people who are just starting out to get their foot in the door and get the process going. And that's, that's why the CR is such a bad idea, because you've got these beginning scientists who've got their entire future in front of them. Somebody like me, it doesn't matter to I'm not going to write another grant. I've <laughs> done it. But I, I just, it just hurts my, crushes my soul to see what's happening to the young people. I think, to the NIH's credit, um, they've, they've gotten a lot of practice in dealing with the CR. Um, regular order, I think, is a thing of fiction, like the unicorns these days. Um, and they do everything they can within their power to soften the blow that a CR would have. But there's a certain point of field triage that you can do when you're still going to lose the patient no matter how hard you're trying to kind of extend things throughout. Um, you know, so they do, you know, they do their best to predict what funding may come and when it may come to kind of lighten the load so that you know, they can fund those new grants. But the really unique thing about the NIH and how much budget is, is so much of it is already obligated even though it's appropriated every year brand new, a uh, portion of that every year is already obligated to grants that they'd agreed to do you know, two, three, four years ago. So it does have an impact. Um, like I said, to their credit, they do what they can um, to run the fire drill to keep, keep the ship afloat. Um, but it has been, I don't remember, regular order last time that happened was, I don't even know, maybe five, six, seven, eight years ago, maybe longer. Um, we're getting to the point now where doing the kind of fire drills just aren't able to keep things afloat as well as they have in the past. This is what the NIH does with the 10 percent decreases in everyone's budget is to sweep the funds so that they can do other things with it, like fund meeting people. Any other questions? Great. It has been an hour, so I want to thank you for your time. I want to thank our panelists for their time, and I also want to thank Senator Walden.